All right. Well, let's try another book. Last time I looked at a textbook. But this time let's look at something that I think might be more interesting to listeners of Physics Frontiers. Um, unfortunately, it's dark, so let's see. There we go. Sleeping Beauties in Theoretical Physics. 26 Surprising Insights. Now, this was a very good book. It's not uh, an easy book in any by any means. It's a very uh, difficult book, really. It's got lots and lots and lots of equations in it, you'll see there. I mean, it's not for the faint of heart, but I think it's got a lot of things in it that people who listen to Physics Frontiers would be interested in. So it's got these 26 surprising insights. Some of them are more surprising than others. Oh, so, oh, that's interesting. Chapter highlights. So, like we looked at before, we looked at one of these, um, people tend to go through the table of contents. So, there, let's, let's see if that, that'll, um, put that in there. So, let's look at some of these things in, that are in here. So, first, this guy has a grand cube of theoretical physics. Now, if you've read Griffiths, Griffiths in his introduction has more or less a square. Um, this grand cube here, um, let's take a look at that, here is saying that there are, in theoretical physics, basically three different ways you can go from down here in the back at the origin is your, Newton, Newton, is your Newtonian mechanics. Then you can go over here in the small axis. The small axis gets you to quantum mechanics. You can come over here to the fast axis that gets you to special relativity. You can come up here and you have Newtonian gravity. All right, so that, those are the three axes. Um, the square in um, Griffith's electrodynamics was just these two axes here, um, the fast and the small. This guy puts in a third one. And this gives you a way to sort of talk about where things are going, where things are, right? So obviously quantum mechanics has been around for a while, so has special relativity. And if you take both of them together, you get to quantum field theory. That's been done pretty well here, right? Um, and if you take this sort of fast and you take the gravity and put them together, you have general relativity, right? So um, all of... These six corners are well known. We've got two corners that aren't known. One is mixing quantum mechanics and gravity, and that's your quantum gravity right here. And then here at this point, you put everything together, and that would be your um, your toe, your th theory of everything, or your gut, or something like that. So this would put everything together. And... Um, you know, that's sort of where people want to take physics, is to get to that point where everything working together. It's basically not just everything's working together, right? You could do that if you just get quantum gravity. Most things work together pretty well, actually. Um, you can get quantum mechanics and gravity together, for example, to do interesting things. You can get oscillations based on that. They've done the experiments. Um, but... What people would really like to do is get everything down to one theory that explains everything. And so that's the um, grand cube of theoretical physics, according to uh, Padmanabhan. Padmanabhan. Pad Padmanabhan. I practiced it ten times and got it right. No, I can't do it anymore. Oh, well. Um, let's see. Then he goes on, right? He talks about the emergence of classical physics. In there, he's going to talk about uh, Wigner's fu Wigner functions and basically how you can look at classical physics as sort of an average of um, all of, or well, sort of an interference, the um, constructive interference of all the probability amplitudes in the world. It's very interesting. Um, then orbits of planets are circles. And he means that actually in a very, um, in a meaningful way. It's, he's looking at phase space. But he goes through quite a bit of stuff there. He's talking about um, sort of a Coulombic interaction. 
and stuff like that. And then he comes over and he does the same thing, the importance of being inverse square, that he'd done here classically for quantum mechanics. And he does that a lot. He'll do two chapters. One will be a little more elementary, and then the next one will do something pretty interesting with what he did previously. So it's pretty interesting. Again, you'll look at the sizes of these chapters, seven pages, um, 18. They're not really, really long chapters either. So uh, they are, again, quite mathematical. Do have these nice boxes right here. So here's a nice um, box on the Langer trick, which uh, I think that's a way to do some sort of semi-classical physics. Let's see. Well, yeah, it says up there in the upper right-hand corner. So that's interesting. Now, again, I've read this. So you see, and this was after I started taking the notes and just leaving them in the books. So that would have been sometime in the last eight years or so. But, um, so it's been reasonably recent, but it's, I read this, I'm sure, in New Orleans. So it's been over six years. All right. Uh, let's see. Potential surprises in Newtonian gravity. Um, and I'd like to talk more about that. And even though I just reviewed this a few hours ago, um, I went through it a few hours ago and was looking at things. Um, I've actually forgotten about it, so I won't do much. And now I can't even see things on my phone. Um, getting new glasses soon. Lagrange and his points, about Lagrange points, but also about um, some uh, ooh, Trojans, Trojan uh, asteroids and how they work and things like that. Very interesting. Getting the most of it. I need to review my review. Um, so I'm going to have to sneak over here. Because I went through and getting the most of it is actually... Oh, it's about um, minimization principles, basically, Mac. About stuff like that. Minimization principles, interesting things like that. Um, surprises in fluid flows. Isochron iso uh, isochronous curiosities. Um, classical and quantum. I think he does actual work in that. He does a lot of work there. So I think some of the... Um, Some of the references were to his own work. It was, it was very sort of interesting, some of the things that it was doing in there uh, with some odd-looking potentials. But if they, if they have a certain way of looking, these strange-looking potentials still give you nice, evenly spaced harmonic oscillators. So that's very, very useful. Um, as one of the quotes he has in here says, the only thing physicists, physicists really know how to do is the harmonic oscillator. That's all That's all we do is solve the harmonic oscillator. Modify things, make approximations, and find a way to turn the problem into a harmonic oscillator. Uh, logarithms of nature, curve of space-time for pedestrians. That, that was fairly interesting. It's basically, gravity and special relativity together. Sort of like we were talking about way up here. Um, black holes are a hot... As, Black hole is a hot topic. Okay, so that is, you know, thermal properties of black holes. Thomas and his precession. Thomas precession. You may have guessed that. A uh, very interesting thing about um, relativity and rotations. Um, I had a professor when I was in, when I was an undergraduate, who was just completely focused on that and, and um, not understanding them, uh, not really believing some of the things that he. He was saying about them, although I'm not sure if that was the way he was interpreting uh, torque as much as it was what was wrong with him. And when Thomas met Foucault, uh, so that's sort of doing Thomas procession with a Foucault pendulum and differential geometry. So extremely interesting. Again, lots of equations. Uh, you'll need to have some idea of what you're doing, but it, I mean, it's really, really interesting stuff in this book. Uh, let's see, the one body problem. 
um, talking about quantum field theory, uh, the straight and narrow path of waves. So in that case, what he's going, uh, let's see, let me make sure. Yeah, in that case, he's talking about how um, waves or basically ray optics comes from wave optics. Uh, that's basically the paraxial optics that he's talking about behind there. Um, and then he's talking about, of course, if quantum mechanics is the paraxial optics, that's taking uh, this sort of optical analogy, right? This is optics and then waves to, you know, waves to particles, particles to waves, right? And um, let's see, make it complex to simplify. Uh, nothing matters a lot that gets us into, uh, you know, the properties of space time and things like that. A little bit about quantum gravity. Uh, radiation. Um, that's actually not that strange. That, that, that's actually stuff I'd seen in sort of like Purcell, at least some of the um, figures are. So it's stuff that, you know, usually gets dropped out, especially in the undergraduate curriculum, but is well within an undergraduate's purview, right? So um, that stuff is stuff you can find in many undergraduate texts that just sort of gets ignored. Um, photon wave and or particle. He basically shows that it doesn't matter what you interpret something as as a wave or a particle, you end up with the same answer in the long run. Angular momentum without rotation, that probably feeds back into your Thomas procession at some point. But um, that's interesting. But here we get in another pair, the, ubiqu the ubiquitous random walk. Very interesting. The drunkard's walk is very useful in um, physics. And so Brownian motion and all that. And then more random walks... Um, and the thing to worry about this is the circuits and the tired drunkard. Um, the thing to remember, the thing about this is 23 is basically, except for, I think the last section, um, one dimensional and 24 is multiple dimensions in the random walk. And that's important because technically there's really no recurrence time for the, um, multi-dimensional random walks, I believe. Uh, where there is a recurrence time for the one-dimensional random walk. But I think you're basically, if you've got multiple dimensions, you basically never get home. Although maybe you should get home because the size of the space is the same. The size of the space is the same, right? That That's what we all learned when we did our um, real analysis, right? Let's see, gravitational instability in, of the isothermal sphere and gravity bends electric field lines. Fairly um, fairly straightforward. So again, very interesting book. All sorts of interesting things you might not see uh, in other places. So this is for those Lagrange points. Right? And so I think it's a really interesting book. Um, so I just wanted to tell you about it and see... That, there's um, some radiation from a mo from a moving particle, from an accelerating particle. Um, so you can see the acceleration in the um, breakup of those field lines because it takes time for the field to actually propagate. Something like that happens. It's a consequence of special relativity. So all sorts of, again, that's what I was saying you see in Purcell as well. So it's something that you can understand, even though it looks like maybe you shouldn't. It sounds more complicated than it is. Um, so a lot of these things are really, really interesting. I, and, you know, they're not really all the same thing. So it's a little bit different than most physics books, but they are all very, very, um, interesting things that, uh, I think, uh, Pad, Padman Abhan, uh, he thought were things that people kind of would like to know but are usually brushed aside because, you know, they're either a little bit complicated or they don't really build up the way we'd like to get the things in the normal curriculum. So 
uh, I do suggest this book. I'll give a link to it at the bottom. Um, but I just wanted to give this to you because I think it's, again, I think it's something that people who listen to the podcast would be a little more interested in than a standard physics um, textbook. I'll, I'll go back to a textbook next time um, just because I know that people love textbook reviews. So, But I'd like to just sort of suggest this for people who are interested in a little something different. All right. Bye now.